TV Network, the solution for humanity. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Living in the West, a series of episodes where we look into the lives of the Muslims living in the West, the Muslim minorities living in the West. In previous episodes, with the importance of this topic generally, we've looked into the permissibility of this group of Muslims in living in the West. We also went on further to look at a visionary uh, strategy for this group of Muslims, a personal a vision, a strategy, and a community-level one. From this, we carried on and looked at some spheres of life that the Muslims fall into, a social, political, and economical. We were looking at the social interaction, and we spoke about certain issues. Uh, with me today, I have Sheikh Haytham al-Haddad from the Muslim Research and Development Foundation, an organization and think tank uh, from London, who helps providing solutions for these Muslims in the West. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Sheikh, in the previous episode, we did speak about a specific issue in this social sphere of the Muslims, which was eating the meat of, say, the Ahl al-Kitab, the people of the book. We never really touched upon, in any depth, eating food for others than Ahl al-Kitab. Can we start from there today, Sheikh? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Yes, we spoke about eating the meat of the people mm -hmm. of the uh, book. I forgot one point here. I would like to mention that point, which is that many Muslims in the West differ about the permissibility of eating the meat provided or available in big supermarkets and uh, maybe eating from McDonald's or Burger King, etc. And they differ a lot, and sometimes they have a lot of dispute, maybe they might fight on this issue. And I would like to tell them that we should not fight on this issue. We should first identify the point of disagreement. Why do we disagree? And what is the point that we disagree on? We disagree on the point that this meat is slaughtered or is not slaughtered. Okay? Is slaughtered meat or is not slaughtered meat? Those who eat from it, it doesn't mean that they go against the ayah, حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَ The meta was made haram for you. No, they don't go against this ayah. But they think that this meat has been slaughtered by the people of the book, and therefore it is halal. Those who see that it is haram, they believe that this meat is either a dead meat, or the people who are slaughtering it are not the people of the book, therefore it is haram. So we should identify the reason behind this disagreement before we carry on. This is one point. This goes smoothly to the point that you have mentioned, Jamil, which is the meat slaughtered by other than the people of the book. We know that in non-Muslim countries, in Western countries, America, Canada, Britain or other European countries, there are the people of the book and there are secular people, there are atheists and there are the Sikh, Hindus and other faith followers. So how do we deal with this issue? What is allowed for us is the meat of the people of the book. الكتاب, only the people of the book. And once we come to the issue of marriage, it is allowed for us to marry the female, the women of the people of the book, as Allah Jalla wa Ala said. Other than the people of the book, we are not allowed to eat their food, and we are not allowed to marry their women. And Allah Jalla wa Ala gave the people of the book a concession because they are originally following a kitab. That's why we call them the people of the book. And Allah Jalla wa Ala called them 
the people of the book Ahl al-Kitab. Uh, so, okay, sorry, Sheikh, um, uh, just to backtrack slightly because uh, you're going to explain to us about the, the people who are not of the book. Um, why is it always that we're seen, especially when we're speaking about the West, we automatically, and uh, give an explanation, we assume that they are the people from the book. Okay, yeah, this point is, historically speaking, Europe is a Christian, okay, continent. And America is, was born after Europe. Both of them, actually, they belong to the Christianity faith, whether America or Europe. Now, the real question here is, those people, many of them, they left Christianity. Do we consider them as the people of the book or not? This is an area, okay, that has been debated or, and is still being debated among so many people. In a nutshell, we consider them the people of the book, although they left Christianity, unless, and this is the ruling, unless any one of them claims that he is not any more Christian and he claims that he is an atheist or Hindu or whatever. So the agnostic, if, agnostic, we are accepting him as being a Christian. Yes. So if they claim that they are Christians, although they don't practice anything from Christianity, they are still considered to be the people of the book. And although those Christians, they don't follow Isa, they insult Isa by saying that Isa is the son of God, they insult Allah Jalla wa'ala by claiming that Allah has a son who is Isa, and they implement this trinity, they are still considered people of the book, although they are mushriks. And the dalil for that is, Allah Jalla wa'ala says in the Quran, لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ ثَالِثُ ثَلَاثَ وَمَا مِنْ إِلَاهٍ إِلَّا إِلَاهُ وَاحِدٍ لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْمَسِيحُ بْنُ مَرْيَمُ Allah Jalla wa'ala called them kuffar because indeed they have disbelieved those who claim that Isa is the son of Allah Jalla wa'ala indeed they disbelieved those who claim that Allah is the third of a three however Allah Jalla wa'ala named those people who disbelieved as the people of the book. Therefore, they are considered to be the kuffar, as the Quran said, and they are the people of the book. There is no contradiction between that. And Allah Jalla wa'ala and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam treated them as the people of the book, although at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were claiming that Allah is the third of a three, or Isa is the son of Allah Jalla wa'ala. The Prophet Sallallahu dealt with them as the people of the book at that time. So this is, their, this is what's been dealt with, so we're going to keep with this. Yes. We're not going to change, okay. we're not going to give a new ruling when it's already been stated. Yeah, mm -hmm. the point here is, although وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ عُزَيْرٍ بْنُ اللَّهِ The Jews said Uzair is the son of Allah. And at that time they said this, yet Allah Jalla wa'ala considered them the people of the book. Similarly, the Christians. Allah Jalla wa'ala named them or called them as the people of the book. The Prophet Sallallahu dealt them, although they are committing this kufr and this shirk, the Prophet Sallallahu dealt with them as the people of the book. Therefore, the people now, if they call themselves as Christians, although they don't practice anything from Christianity, they are considered to be Christians and they take the rulings of Christians. Means we are allowed to marry their women, provided that we witness the other conditions that we are going to discuss, and we are allowed to eat their meat, provided the previous conditions that we have mentioned are met. Okay, now we just clear that up. Now, what about the issue we're going to carry on speaking about the meat of those who are, are seen as mushrik? Exactly. The people. The, of course, the Christians and the Jews are um, mushriks, yeah. but we are talking about other types of mushriks. For example, Hindu, Buddhists, pagans, mm. okay, and atheists. Those people are named kuffar as well, mushriks are as well. We are not allowed to eat their meat. We are not allowed to marry their women, full stop. There is no concession. In terms of meat of the people of the book, it was not reported that the Prophet ﷺ accepted to eat the meat of the mushriki. 
And Allah Jalla wa Ala, we quoted the ayah that Allah Jalla wa Ala says, وَلَا تَأْكُلُوا مِمَّا لَمْ يُذْكَرِ اسْمُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَإِنَّهُ لَفِسْقُ Don't eat the meat of those who do not remember or mention the name of Allah Jalla wa Ala because it is evil or it is bad. The concession was given, وَطَعَامُ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ حِلُّ لَكُمْ The meat of the people of the book. And the concession was given to them only, so we cannot extend on that condition. The atheists, they are the same. If they call themselves as atheists, although maybe their ancestors were Christians, but now they don't admit that they are Christians, then with them as pure mushriks or kafirs, and we are not allowed to marry their women, or we are not allowed to eat their meat. Okay, there's a question that comes up. We're going to tackle it in the... The second part of this episode, but it's how far do we go into investigating who are the Ahlul Kitab and who if are the Mushrikeen? Okay, and we're going to take a, a short break and return in a couple of minutes. Please stay with us on Living in the West. <laughs> Pearls of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It is narrated on the authority of Abu Zar, may Allah be pleased with him, that the Messenger of Allah, may peace be upon him, said, Three are the persons with whom Allah would neither speak on the day of resurrection, nor would look at them, nor would absorb them and there is a painful chastisement for them. The Messenger of Allah, may peace be upon him, repeated it three times. Abu Zar, may Allah be pleased with him, remarked, They failed and they lost. Who are these persons, Messenger of Allah? Upon this he, the Holy Prophet, said, They are the dragger of lower garment, the one who reminds others of his gifts, and the seller of goods by false oath. Sahih Muslim, Volume 1, Book of Faith, Hadith Number 192. Our Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have spread around the globe. May endless blessings be upon thee. His life is being examined in the glare of the global media spotlight. the duty of every Muslim, every Muslim to present to the world the truth of his life and the excellence of his character. And we have not sent you, O Muhammad, except as a mercy to the universe. To do this, you have to know your prophet. It's something that you simply can't afford to be ignorant of. Send your peace on your slave Muhammad. Study the exemplary personality of our Prophet, peace be upon him, which attracts people of all faiths and nationalities in Know Your Prophet, peace be upon him. Next on Peace TV. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Living in the West. Uh, Sheikh Hatham, just before the break, uh, I posed a question. I think it can summarize the whole issue of this, of eating from Ahl al-Kitab or non-Ahl al-Kitab. Uh, some people go into a lot of difficulty in researching whether a shop is owned by somebody from Ahl al-Kitab or not. How further should we investigate when it comes to our food, especially uh, in the West? Yeah, as we said, we should not have this as a, a big issue of dispute. We mm. should identify the reason behind the dispute. And to be honest with you, what we need to tell people, if there is halal, okay, why do you go for 
the other shops. And here there is a very valid point with those people who say that we are not allowed to eat from any shop mm -hmm. owned by the people owned by non-Muslims because they said we don't know who works in the slaughtered houses. Whether they are from the people of the book or they are atheists or maybe Hindus or Sikh. So they have a valid point. We are not quite sure that this meat has been slaughtered and has been slaughtered authentically by the people of the book. Therefore, we should leave this issue of dispute and just eat from the halal meat. And also, and I think it reinforces what you said before, is that if we stick to, like some people I've heard many times say, especially in some of the Western countries, there's so much politics on halal meat, we should stick to the kosher meat because we know that's kosher. But the problem here is that they fall back on one of the strategies, which is to put forward halal meat. So even if you mean struggling to establish exactly, halal meat, exactly. it's a struggle. And, you know, in many Western countries, they have organizations to monitor the halal meat. HFA and so forth. Exactly. HFA. For example, in, in the UK, they have HMC, mm -hmm. okay, Halal Meat Committee. Mm -hmm. It monitors whether this meat has been slaughtered according to the conditions. And by the way, they have successfully won this uh, argument about stunning. And now the HMC food or meat has not been stunned. And this goes in line with what we have said before when we said that the community should build organizations that cater for the Muslims' need, for the individual's need. And those organizations cannot be set up by individual Muslims, but they can set up by the community. And if the community is united, then they will be able to establish more of those organizations that fight for their rights. For example, the issue of halal meat, the issue of Muslim schooling, the issue of women wearing hijab, the issue of discrimination against Muslims in the workplace or in other spheres. Okay, I think a point that we can make here, at least, especially to our viewers, is that halal meat especially, it's in many of the Western countries, it's really a de facto standard in terms of de facto for as a type of meat. Schools, prisons, hospitals, aeroplanes, wherever you go, halal meat has taken that. That's due to this committee, the community working for this. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And this is really a very good point, Brother Jamil, because what we say, Muslims should not be apologetic. Muslims should leave this defeated mentality. They can achieve really very well in the current setup now, if they come together and if they fight. But imagine, imagine if our ancestors, for example, in Britain, we came from Britain, and they have given up this issue of halal meat and they started to eat the other meat then this issue of halal will not be recognized, will not be officially recognized. And that's what we say to non-Muslims as well. We told them, do you have a problem with halal meat? They said, no. We said, this is part of Sharia. You don't have a problem with part of Sharia. Why? Because it became de facto or it became something that is unavoidable. And this is exactly what we want Muslims to work for. Okay, now there's a point that you touched on, a very uh, controversial point, not controversial, but very anticipated point. You spoke about marriage here. And you said that, you know, Ahl al-Kitab, we can eat from their meat. Also, we can marry their women. Now, let's look into the issue of marriage, Sheikh. Especially in the West, this is one of the biggest ways of social interaction for the Muslim communities is marriage like this. Can we start off the discussion? What, what are the parameters of marriage in a non-Muslim society? Okay. Before talking about marriage, would you allow me, Brother Jamil, to speak about an experience about this issue of halal meat and the issue of community. No, please carry on. Yes. I just uh, remember this no, story. Please do, carry on. I was talking to a brother who is in charge of one of the uh, Muslim organizations in Britain about this issue of unity among Muslims and this principle of wala wa bara. And the essence of wala wa bara is that don't side against your Muslim community. Don't, and we even if we accept that we have so many differences, we should not wash our dirty clothes, okay? Not in the public, basically. In the public. Mm. And he said, wallahi, this is a very important principle. And he said one time in one of the areas in the Great Britain, it is not in England, 
he said we were marching for halal food to be the standard food provided by some colleges. And those colleges accepted that because non-Muslims there, they don't have a problem with the halal food if it is according to the regulations and the standard food agency regulations. And he said we were about to finalize that agreement. And in the last meeting, we had one Muslim brother joining us from one of the organizations, and he never knew the history of this issue. And all of a sudden, when we were sitting, he said, to be honest with you, why do we need to have halal food as a standard okay, menu, in the standard menu? He said, because we as Muslims are allowed to eat from the meat of the people of the book. And he said, look, he as if he stabbed us from the back. After all of this that we have gone through, he is coming without understanding the reality, the context. He is coming to what? To side against Muslims in this strategic issue for us, unknowingly or by ignorance. And that's why sometimes we tell some of the, those scholars who give fatwa for Muslims living in the West. Before giving any fatwa, you have to know the reality of what is happening there. There might be some issues regarding politics there in that country. Muslims in that country might be pushing for certain things. They want to achieve it. It is not a matter of this issue, the technicality of this issue, whether it is halal or haram. For example, this issue of eating that meat, it is allowed, as we said, but Muslims are trying to aim for something bigger. So if you go against that as if you are letting them down, and let me give another example, because this issue is a really a very important issue, and it goes with the strategies that Muslim communities can have. You remember the row that took place recently, or uh, maybe two years ago, about the niqab. Issue of niqab. Covering, yeah, mm -hmm. covering niqab and the comments made by Jack Straw, etc. Now, in Britain, a group of scholars uh, came together and they wrote a declaration supporting the issue of niqab. Now, they have not spoken about the obligation of niqab. They haven't spoken about the obligation of niqab. They worded it carefully, and I was one of the signatories on that declaration. We said that the issue of niqab is part of our deen. Some Muslims believe in it. Therefore, we should give them that right and that freedom mm -hmm. Okay, to observe that because that freedom does not go against the public law or does not cause any harm. Mm -hmm. Okay, or to be more accurate, does not cause any harm for others. Therefore, they should be given that right. Now, many Muslims came together and wrote that declaration, and there was a good outcome because of that declaration. So when Muslims come together and they have a vision in their mind, they will achieve well. After that, we heard certain fatawa from some scholars, from some different countries and from some Arab countries, they started to say that niqab is not obligatory and these fatawa have been translated and Muslims in the West because of oppression, because of other circumstances that they are facing, they should give up this issue or maybe they can consider giving up the issue of niqab or some of them even if they leave niqab then it would be all right. And they have published these fatwas in English, and some people started to circulate these fatwa. Now here, I find it, from a strategic point of view, I found it very difficult to adapt. Why? Because here we are not talking about the permissibility or the obligation of niqab. We are talking about a bigger issue, because the Muslim community in Britain realized that attacking the niqab is attacking the identity part of the identity of Muslims. And once they can achieve banning Muslims from observing this, then this will be a precedent for banning Muslims from observing other rituals. And that is the key issue here. That's why those who give fatwas to Muslims in the West, they have to be very, very careful in talking about these issues. And we have made a comparison between 
the situation in France and the situation in Britain. Because France, the Muslims were not coming together to support the issue of hijab as it should be supported. The government could easily ban hijab from being manifested in the public sphere. But in Britain, what has happened is that the government has to think first about the issue of covering the face. And once this issue is banned, then they need to move to the hijab. So the bar is high. So they have to deal with this high bar first before going to the issues below it. While in France, because the bar is not high, mm -hmm. they could ban the hijab easily. And that's why we say once we have strategies, overall strategies as Muslims living in the West, and these strategies are clear for Muslims elsewhere, we will be achieving well. We will be successful. And as you clearly said, that we can achieve, Muslims in different places achieve very well. So let us leave this defeated mentality and apologetic mindset and take it out because we can really do very well. Sheikh Haytham al-Haddad, Jazakallah Khair, very poignant point to leave on. That's the end of this episode of Living in the West. Very important topic, so I hope you join me next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Awakening contents. Unlock your hearts. Let us start to reflect and interact with the glorious Quran through simple and interactive grammar exercises. Explore the secrets of success that exist in the blessed lines of the Holy Quran. Using what you recite every day and night, learn 250 words that occur 55,000 times or 70% words of the Quran. Let's understand the Quran. Let's join Dr. Abdul Aziz Abdul Rahim in. Let's understand the Quran every Saturday at 4 p.m. and repeat telecast at 2.30 a.m. UK on Peace TV. Thursdays provide. In Britain, we are facing one big problem that are you Muslim or British? The space to talk. In India, back home, they ask, are you a Muslim first or Indian first? And we Muslims should know how to reply, how to turn the tables over. The place to knock. Why Trinity cannot be regarded in that sense, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The opportunity to ask. But even if we agree that what the Christians say, that he was crucified, so if Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, died for three days, who controlled the world? That means even God died? The freedom to unmask. So there are various ways which we can prove the argument to be wrong. Let's meet Dr. Zakir every Thursday at 6.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 9.30 a.m. UK on Peace TV.